One, two, three. Welcome to Three Song Stories, home of the song story, which we define as stories that are connected to memories that automatically resurface whenever you hear a particular song that has become bound to that time and place. Thanks for listening. I'm Mike Canary. Our guest this week is Karen Parsons. Karen is probably best known for playing Hillary on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. The Fresh Prince listing for Hillary on Fandom.com describes her as, quote, impulsive, shallow, attractive, most of the time very dim-witted and extremely self-centered, who can come off as a very arrogant airhead, end quote. Karen is not like that. The show was a huge hit and ran for six seasons beginning in 1990, leaving an indelible mark on pop culture. Her character Hillary was and is truly beloved by fans around the U.S. and beyond. What her fans didn't know until 2005 or so was that Parsons was also a writer who spent quite a bit of time writing short fiction and learning about history, particularly inspiring and empowering stories of African American achievement. Once she set aside acting in the early 2000s and had her first child, Parsons decided it was time to take her passion for writing and history seriously and so founded a nonprofit called Sweet Blackberry. They would turn her stories about little known African-American figures, ones that she thought would pique the imaginations of young people into short films and picture books. The animated films feature narration from voices like Alfre Woodard, Queen Latifah, Chris Rock, and Lawrence Fishburne. Sweet Blackberry has produced five videos and two picture books, and Parsons published her first young adult novel called How High the Moon in 2019, and has another one coming out this summer. How High the Moon was inspired by her mother's childhood stories of being a young person growing Growing up in South Carolina during the time of Jim Crow. We crossed paths with Karen when she was on the FGCU campus to give a presentation called Journey of Unsung Heroes, and she was gracious enough to come by the studio to share with us and with you her three song stories. Hi, Karen. Hi. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Welcome to Southwest Florida. Thank you. Have you had a chance to listen to music at all today? Well, I may have had the chance, but I haven't. <laughs> you have not listened to music so far today. I haven't listened to any music today. It was kind of an up and running thing. So, no, I haven't. What do you do to spend time while you're traveling? Do you listen to music? Do you listen to podcasts? Do you I, read? Do you write? Um, I listen to books on tape. Or, you know, I do a lot of that. Um, I I read the actual book book and I listen to music. Yeah, I listen to podcasts that have been recommended usually by friends. Do you have like a cassette recorder for the books on tape? No, I don't. <laughs> I just think it's funny that we do still call them tape. that. But they're they're on, generations they're from not tape. On tape. Okay. What are the, what are the big uh, the big plastic binders yeah. like oh. with all the tapes in them? Oh gosh, no, 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 no. <laughs> what are you listening to right now? Are you in um one? in a book? Yeah. I'm 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 straddling books. I'm trying to figure out what I want to read because I just re- I just finished a couple of thrillers, and I'm I'm finding that sometimes when you're write when I'm writing something, I want to write I want to read something that um, helps inspire the genre or the area that I'm writing, and I started listening to the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, I've never read the book. And I started listening to it. It's Lawrence Fishburne. Somebody was telling me, you know, Lawrence Fishburne narrates Ooh. it. And I was like, oh, that might be really great. And I started, and it was, but then I started thinking, this is not helping the book I'm writing. <laughs> so I'm not sure. I, but I'm really, I'm, I'm into it. So we'll see. Okay. We'll get to the book you're writing in a little later. But um, you grew up in Southern California. Yes. You say you grew up in Santa Monica? Santa Monica, California. How would you characterize the musical background of your childhood? Oh, boy. Well, I mean, I grew up in the 70s and 80s in Santa Monica. And, um, you know, it was very, um, I don't know, it's a little hippie-ish, you know, kind of upbringing, I guess. My, my parents weren't at all hippie types. But Santa Monica, Venice Beach of of that era, of that time kind of was, Um it's so funny. The first thing that comes to mind is like Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> it was the first movie. I think it was one of the first movies or the first movie I saw. It was a it was a double feature. It was Godspell and Jesus Christ Superstar wow. at the Criterion Theater at the mall. And um, and then later I ended up getting the record album. I think a friend had it, 
at first when I was younger. And the, of Superstar? Of Jesus Christ Superstar. Yeah. And I, I know the whole thing by heart. <laughs> it's really kind of frightening. <laughs> you still remember any of it? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, if we, my daughter I and mean, I've got my daughter doing it, so my daughter and I will sing the songs. And my husband cannot stand it. It's like for him, it's like the worst thing in the world. But we both love it. We think it's brilliant. <laughs> what kind of music were your parents playing? Oh, my parents hardly had any records at all. It's so terrible when I look back on it. I remember that we had Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass, the famous. Um, I think everyone had that. That apparently. same one it with, comes the, up a with lot. the whipped cream. I think the cover was why everyone. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely been on here before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, I, it was almost on here for me because that was that was um, that was one of the records we had in the house. We had a, um, one of the Supremes records. Don't remember which one. We had, um, um, what's his name? It's like, for me, it's not Christmas until Burl Ives sings Holly Jolly Christmas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we had the, we had Burl Ives, you know, Christmas, and we had a Chipmunks Christmas album. Yeah, that was us. Yeah. And, and I think that that was our collection of albums. I think we actually did have a Ray Charles for a while. I remember a blue album with kind of a black image, like almost like a silhouette, but it wasn't kind of like image. Um, and then that disappeared. But <laughs> that was that was it. Like we didn't have a lot of music. My dad did not listen to music. You know who my dad liked and we had for a minute around the house? Teresa Brewer. Does anybody know the yodel? I don't. The yodeling Bring Teresa some Brewer. Up, Richard, let's get a little yodeling in here. <laughs> my so, t- Teresa Brewer. Teresa Brewer was um, who my dad yeah. While he's pulling that up, I actually read a, an article recently that said that um they did a, a search of how common records were at Goodwills. Oh. And used that to determine, like, how popular albums were. And the most commonly found album at Goodwill is that Herb Albert in the T. Oh, is it? <laughs> this is Music, Music, Music by Teresa Pure Brewer. Brewer. This is some old. Okay. She can't take it. <laughs> Was that what your dad was listening to? Well, I've heard this one not that long ago because uh-huh. I actually tried last a few months back last year <laughs> to bring it to my dad who couldn't hear it, but I was trying to. And um, that same song? No, no, no. Oh, but I, oh, but yeah. I brought I I found that song though while looking for songs for her. The ones, the ones as a child, I forgot. I found in looking, I ended up having like a complete, you know, like a breakout in a rash moment when I when I when I actually hit one of them that was. One, I think, that was played around my house a lot. Your mm. facial expression when you heard just that beginning was everything. <laughs> yeah. it said, it's a real it, reaction. It was your v- we're, visceral We're feeling. wielding music against you, Karen. <laughs> um, did you play any instruments? Uh, the recorder for, you know, a week yeah. like everyone else. <laughs> but that, that was the extent of it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, was, uh, your bio says that you declared you were going to be an actor when you were six. Uh, so was the idea, were you the, the kid that was always performing around kind of screwing around kind singing of annoying no i couldn't say with you know my dad my dad did to me when i was about oh gosh how old was i, I don't know i was i was listening to a mickey mouse club record this is the new mickey mouse club and i remember i had the record on and i was so into the new mickey mouse club because mm-hmm. <laughs> i wanted to be an actor a performer since i was so little and I had to watch everything that all the other little kids did. I had to see everything Jodie Foster was in. I had to see every, <laughs> including Taxi Driver when I was way too young <laughs> watching Taxi Driver. And so I had to see all these things. And so I was really into the new Mickey Mouse Club. Here are these kids performing, right? And I was listening to the album with um, headphones on. So nobody else could hear the music but me. But I was recording myself on a cassette player. Uh, I was taping myself. And my dad walked by because, of course, in the room, all you could hear was me just belting. Right. It was, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't hear anything that I was listening to. You were not being uh, accompanied. <laughs> and I don't know if you know how, how, those, how those recordings go, but they're not quite what you think they are. Yeah. And so my dad came up and lifted my little thing and said, you sound terrible. And he thought, <laughs> and just laughed. He just thought that was the funniest thing. And I was like, oh, yeah, shut up. Get out of here. And I never sang in public again. Here we go. I de- <laughs> Seriously, I played it back. I played it back and it was confirmed. It was so bad. And I thought, oh, my God, he's right. Zip. And I stopped singing for years. I wouldn't sing around people, hmm. you know. And I want. I still danced like crazy and acted like crazy. And Broadway was kind of like what I would have loved to do if I could just not sing. 
<laughs> yeah. Those, when, when you all talk Broadway shows. <laughs> were you doing theater and stuff like in middle school? I wasn't. I, um, you know, I grew up in Santa Monica, California. And so I got involved. I did get involved in um, I tr- in theater, like local theater. There was adults, you know, productions with adults. I, I remember I designed a cover of a playbill for one. And my best friend and I um, helped with sets, building sets and sewing costumes for another. Like we, I wanted to be involved in some way. And then we discovered an acting class, a workshop. And I think we were like hmm, 13 and 14 years old or something like that. And and it was supposed to be 18 and over, but the teacher said, okay, look, if you guys take this really seriously, you can come into the class. And so we, you know, I saw this, you know, girl hurling a mug across the stage at somebody else's head. And, and I was like, wow, I want to be up there. I want to do this. You know, it was like real acting, right? <laughs> real violence. <laughs> and, um, and so we got in. And, but then, you know, but it was great because, you know, suddenly I was introduced to very serious Stuff like Stanislavski and Uta Hagen, we were having to like read and learn about craft, and and that was all great. Um, you started asking me this is something else though about, and I, I just want. Well, no, I was just trying to figure out, you know, um, if, you know, when you do theater in middle school, that oh, a- yeah. at that age, if you do it through well, school, it's almost always having to sing. It's kind of well, what I was like. How did you is. navigate those times? I'll tell you how if I navigated. You weren't going to be in the musicals. Exactly. <laughs> well, when I was in high school, when I started high school, we started high school in tenth grade. I think they do in ninth grade these years, but these days. But we started in tenth grade. I started at Santa Monica High School. And I was so excited because I was finally going to be able to. I wasn't thinking about the singing part. I was just thinking I'm going to be able yeah. to be in on theater and, and this is after play. that workshop. This is this is the, during. This is oh, during. This is, so this is still something still that happening. I had gotcha. discovered, and was still in, involved in. And now um, we were on dance. My friends and I were all in dance ensemble, so we were performing in front of the whole school. We all got into that and mandatory. Um, assemblies like everyone had to come and watch us dance you know we, we were <laughs> captive good. audience we were yeah. good yeah. right but that but I was in theater arts class and my friends and I about four or five of us um, we were kind of we were like this giggly troublemaking group I wasn't causing trouble I was peanut gallery <sighs> I learned the hard way about the peanut gallery thing yeah. um because, you know, I had friends that were wisecracking or making, so doing things behind the teacher's back. Teacher hated, the theater arts teacher hated, hated, hated our group. Mm-hmm. And so finally one day, one of my friends was caught cheating off of another friend's paper and all of us were kicked out oh, of the class. this story got dark. Yeah. I didn't know we were going there. Oh, it gets darker. Okay. Uh, all of us <laughs> were kicked out of the class. Wow. And given, they were given fails. Those of us who were just Innocent by who didn't know what was that it even was happening were given D's, kicked out of theater arts, and this is my first year of school, and told we were no longer allowed to participate in any theater arts productions for the rest of our time at the school. Huh. That was it. Huh. And I was like, wait a minute. I finally Dream over. Yeah, like, dream schools. done. Hmm. Totally cut out at the end. And you stayed at that school for the rest of that time. Not exactly. I took the proficiency exam and got out of school school early. As quickly as you could. Um, But that was, and I'm sure that was a part. I I didn't make that decision. My dad had wanted me to do that because he was trying to get. He was late, but he was like, "I want to get you out of school and into college before you start thinking about boys." (laughs) (laughs) You're late, Dad. (laughs) But um, and you know, my route was different. I didn't go the college route then, anyway. So. But all the same, I'm sure it had a lot to do with me saying, sure, I'll take this test and get out of here because yeah. what am I doing? This is, you know, all I've wanted since I was six years old is to be able to act. And now I have a state, I can actually get up on stage and act. And mind you, Robert Downey Jr. was in the front row of theater arts and he never <laughs> got in trouble at all. <laughs> <laughs> In up, your class? He was looking back over his shoulder at the troublemakers over there. He was in your class? <laughs> yes. That's and and he, he, he's, he okay, was the well, well-behaved guy okay, in the front row. Let's, let's put this on hold because I have some follow-ups to that. But let's do your first song and then we'll, we'll get back into that. Uh, let's do your first song. It's the, uh, it's the You Got the Love, right? That's it. How it's would you like to proceed? Rufus and Shaka Khan. Let's listen to that, please. All right. This is Karen Parsons' first song today. This is You Got the Love by Rufus and Shaka Khan off the 1974 album Rags to Rufus. 
Wow, that's so good. <laughs> so good. She's so good. Um, I think I was, I think, well, my cousin Yvette came and lived with us when I was, I think, in the third grade, third, fourth. She was there, I think, when I, and yeah, around that time she stayed for a couple years or so. And, um, she you know she was like she came from baggies from boston she was 15 i was a kid and she kind of rocked my world in that way that she like all of a sudden like soul train was on in the house you know so you were in third grade and she was a 15 year old from boston yeah okay, i just wanted to get that straight in my head <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i think i think that's when i first either the third or fourth grade i think i was first like introduced to like soul train uh-huh. and um shaka and I mean, I think Shaka. I think Shaka blew my mind because I still, whenever I see her, I still get when I see old clips and things, or I listen to that music, it just does something to me. So I think it's still it's affected me so deeply. She was so, um, she was so alive, and she was so vivacious and beautiful and wild, just like big smile, big hair, um, so like unapologetic, just like here I am, you know. And um, just basking in all of it, in her talent and in her friendships, because they all look like they were having so much fun. She and Rufus look like they really like clicked and, you know, their album covers, they're all just like laughing and rolling around. And, um, you know, of course, I was too young for any of like the sexual yeah. stuff to like land, mm-hmm. but the energy was there very clearly. And I think it really affected me. And I think it really affected me that, here was this brown girl with big hair. And I was a brown girl with big hair. Um, and she was like, you still, in, you still, still are. Still big. <laughs> I'm still brown and my hair's still big. Um, but she was like, you know, and then she was like on the album cover with barefoot in her jeans. And like, here I was, you know, padding around Santa Monica in my jeans and barefoot, with, you know. And she was, it just felt familiar. And, Ex- not it was not just acceptable it felt like celebrated like this who she was what she was right which was me too and um and i think it was a real contrast to a lot of what i probably had been around and know, you know Teresa Brewer <laughs> certainly <laughs> contrast to that to Teresa Brewer but it was just really um just liberating mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, you looked like you were going to chime in. Do you think she like? Do you think like that that whole vibe like imprinted on you, or is like an archetype or something that what you kind of wanted to channel your life toward? You know, I mean, what subconsciously you mean? Yeah, because <laughs> it's possible. I mean, it's possible that at such a young age, I recognized something familiar and then maybe leaned in yeah. to it in my life. It's quite possible. Um, makes sense. Hmm. If I'm gonna psychoanalyze me we do a little of that on this show <laughs> sometimes <laughs> um do you listen to that music I and mean, is that when, like when was the last time you listened to that song closely not that long ago oh yeah although i heard a little a little maybe because of these headphones i heard a little piece in there that i hadn't heard before Ooh, it was so sweet that was so nice i love that when you like to hear something you haven't heard before in music something that you know most musicians pick up but we hear that a lot on the show because these nice studio headphones, you know. Was not, that was cool. Um, okay, so we're going to get back to, you know, you get kicked out <laughs> of a theater oh. <laughs> in, in high school. So you basically, you know, um, you got kicked out, said you couldn't be on stage, couldn't be in a show. So you kind of took we the We couldn't the even, blacklisted. wait, I have to say, yeah, now, I told you, yeah. we, were da- we were in dance ensemble performing in front of the entire school. We were not even allowed to audition to be dancers in Oklahoma. You it were was, like banned from art. We couldn't. Yeah, I know, I know you mean the. I know you mean the production, the, but I just for a second. Oh, from Oklahoma. I, like, I was like, even in Oklahoma, you're not allowed. I, I couldn't go to Oklahoma. It was a federal ban. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. No, we could not. Perf- we couldn't even be backup dancers in the musical that the school was doing of Oklahoma, and we were the dancers. We were the da- we were dance ensemble. <laughs> if you were to run into Robert Downey Jr. today, would he be like losers? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I have run into him, and maybe that's what he was thinking. Because <laughs> he said he didn't remember me. Oh, uh, <laughs> stupid. Yeah. You just said think, you yeah, remember all the girls. The guys I just said, you know, us in the back of the room, man. <laughs> oh. So then, <laughs> how did you forge your way toward becoming an actor if that was all taken off your plate? Like, yeah, I was going to ask. Your, like, what was your game plan at that well, point? Well, school wasn't my whole life. Well, yeah. Right. So there. <laughs> um, no, we saw, I had, you know, I had this great workshop that I got involved in and took very seriously and I was learning and I kept doing that and I I mean were, he wasn't going to stop me from acting I wish I could remember that damn man's name because I would love to put him on blast I was on a Jay Leno <laughs> show when I back when I did Fresh Prince and Jay Leno was like do it tell us who it was and I was like oh my gosh I'm Jay Leno right I can't remember his name <laughs> I mean, I, I really wanted to blast that. He you knows. need to look that up. Yeah, and I know. So I have think it, it think it three or four times so you have it ready have next it, time you, you have are, a window. I guess it's get part a of tattooed just, on the inside of your hand. Of <laughs> if you want to uh, think on it, and I can I, add it to the credits of this show. <laughs> <laughs> we can Google it. And special thanks to. We can Google it. Okay, Mister Jerkhead and the school, and we can figure that out. Okay. Mr. Jerkhead. Okay, so so you were doing the workshops and stuff. Like, what was your first, um, you know, gig? Like, what? When did you get your first, like, you know, acting gig? My was first it... real acting gig. I mean, uh, my first acting, real acting. <laughs> I was, um, I think it was nineteen. My first real acting gig. Um, yeah, it would come later, and. Yeah, I was in at workshops and working away, and I actually met my acting. Um, I met my theatrical agent in a class because he came to. He was a friend of the teachers, and he would come watch workshops from time uh-huh. to time. And because, um, like I said, I grew up in Southern California, so you know, agents are there. That you know, Hollywood agents. And so he came and watched a class, and I happened to be doing a scene from Sybil. Oh, <laughs> that could go really badly. Did you get to throw or a it could mug? Go really well. I didn't throw anything. I didn't throw a mug at anyone's head. That would be the one to throw. Okay. <laughs> no, but I did go storming out through the because we, we we had the workshop in a church or it used to be a church, and so um, I went storming out of the doors, the double doors, and the end, and it was very dramatic. And of course, a scene from Sybil could go really horribly, yeah. or it could go well, and it went really well. It went went well enough anyway. It felt good to me, and um, it went well enough that this guy was interested in representing me, and it took a a little while before I actually followed up, but he ended up being my theatrical agent, and he was the agent I was with when I got Fresh Prince, too. So you've dragged your feet around what your actual first gig was, though. Oh. (laughs) Are we back there? (laughs) I thought we went past that. Um, It was a movie called Death Spa. Death Spa. Like, yeah, you've like seen a spa it, right? that you'd go to? To die. To die. <laughs> like a horror movie? Did you die? It was a Cult. horror. I sure did. Yeah, it was a horror film. How did you die? They didn't show how I died. I just, uh, you know, the camera like. How did you imagine like, you died? Um, That's well, spectacular. Oh, they're nice. Isn't That's, that a good? What a I need poster. A, I actually need a, co- I need a copy of that, that poster. That is amazing movie cover yeah that's pretty great please that's everyone google death spa death so you, spa so you died off camera i died off camera and then my head went my head went rolling but i go by <laughs> later i think later in the so did you get the, to see like a, a prosthetic of your head i didn't see it like, on set i don't think uh, i think i saw it in the movie really fast and i knew that they were doing it and it was really I mean, I saw the movie. I think once. I you have to. I, I I know. I was Brooke. <laughs> you were Brooke. I was Brooke. Okay, we. I, I have to have. The, is it about a spa that kills people? Not like a murderer at a spa. Can I read? Please read the time? description. You didn't know we were going to talk about that spa nope. this much, did you? <clears throat> no, I didn't. Customers at an exclusive fat farm are haunted by a force which turns exercise equipment into deadly killing machines. Coming to a theater December 1st, 1989. It's maximum overdrive, but with exercise machines. But with what ellipticals. Is- <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah. Exclusive fat farm is what gets me. Yeah. Exclusive fat farm is pretty farm. good because I never heard that before. But it was it was the I think it was the the wife the wife the the wife of the owner died somehow and she was really possessive and so she's like you know he's the hot guy uh, at the spa and like you know and he gets involved with another girl so of course she has to get killed or almost killed but not until the end everybody else gets wiped out early like everybody else who makes the this dead wife pissed 
you know, they get they are doing their arm exercises and their arms get pulled out of the sockets and <laughs> or they're in the steam room and the steam room goes crazy this. and like the steam and the tiles the start flying set off. Just a gym in a town somewhere. <laughs> I think they were just like it was like little corners. I just remember like like there'd be like a little corner set that would like t- it was pretty bad. I mean, I I blew out the mic when I screamed for my death scene because mm. something supposed to comes in the room. I'm supposed to scream and mm. I get I was I always think about that. I'm like. Have seen this film? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> there, oh there are some amazing taglines. Strange things are brewing at the local gym for a workout in hell. These e- <laughs> the evil of the past has found a place in the present. You'll sweat blood. Oh. But there are a lot of reviews on uh, Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb that people said it was hard to find but worth watching. I'm so. going to watch this. <laughs> So I'm it's gonna like, watch it's this, like watching this Showgirls. I'm expect- yeah. I love that movie. <laughs> See, Let's not but, even go there. No, that but that's the a, thing. It's a cold classic. Yeah. That's, it's the thing. People, you enjoy it so much yes. for... Which whatever the reason you well, choose thank you for, <laughs> for bringing this up. So let's culture. move on <clears throat> past Death Spa. Yeah. <laughs> um, how long then between Death Spas? You said that was what 1987. It was 89, 89? I guess. Mm-hmm. So right, not long before Fresh Prince. I got so. Fresh Prince in ninety. <laughs> well, wait, well, I wanted to ask about so like, but Class Act happened before that. No, it happened Mid? the first. It happened after the first season of Fresh got Prince, it. I believe. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because we had you know we have a season, then we'd have like a little summer break and try yeah. to squeeze in a film if you could. Yeah. And then a season, and then squeeze in another job. So I was going to ask if when you find out when you found out like for real, like I got this new TV show. Yeah. If it was like a big deal or like the next gig that you got. But based on what you just said, uh-huh. you must have been like, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I didn't know. I mean, well, it's not Death Spot. It wasn't though. Death Spot. <laughs> no, it wasn't Death Spot. Hey, listen, I got Taft Heart lead in Death Spot, which means I got my my SAG card. Well, so, congratulations. So, it was a stepping yay. stone. And I did learn. Some things. Sure. I don't know. I learned some things, but <laughs> whatever they were. <laughs> but um, but it, it was an, interest, an interesting experience. But on Fresh Prince, yeah, we did the pilot for the show, and which we shot in like a short week. I think it was like four days. We had not a full week, and we all clicked so well. We had so much fun. We liked each other so much, and then that was that, right? And everyone loved it, and it seemed like great, great, great. And I went back to my hostessing job. At Delmonico's, I went back and and I remember Will and a bunch of people coming to the um, window on Sunday when I was getting ready to open the restaurant and I'm like doing the books, <laughs> I'm doing my paperwork and stuff before I have to open, and they're in the window laughing and pointing and just making faces at me, <laughs> and and I went around the outside. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And they were like, what are you doing here? What's wrong with you've, you? You've filled your last salt shaker, Karen <laughs> Parson. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, because I didn't know. Hey, I didn't know yet what was going to happen. I, I want to quit my day job. Mm-hmm. I didn't know we had a good time, you know, but until they tell me. So I went back to work and was, well, I was a hostess for a minute. And, um, yeah. Then you got the gig, Then we got though. the full pickup. We got the pickup for the thing, and it was like, Do you remember yeah, what that felt like? Baby. Like when you had that certainty? I know as an actor, you know, you always want to have some kind of certainty. Oh, that it gave not... you some at least near-term certainty. It was wild. I mean, it was a strange time. I remember the first season coming home to notices on my door that I was going to be evicted and my heat was going to be turned off and things like that because I didn't have, I didn't know how to all yeah. of a sudden balance my time. I was never there. And I'm like, no, I finally have money. <laughs> I actually have money now like to pay these things. You can't kick me out now. Um, but it was hard to try to like balance it all and realize, oh, my goodness, I need a business manager. What a concept. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. and then eventually it was like, oh, I need an assistant because I can't get anything done in my life. I'm gone all day into the night. And um, so, yeah, it was it was interesting to learn, especially when you're like, you know, I think what was I, 22, I think. Mm-hmm. When I got the show, so I was, you know, I was, uh, I didn't know anything about anything. Do you have any uh, songs that will always take you back to those times, like filming that TV show, besides like the theme song? Besides, yeah. Um, you know, any other songs that just, re- <sighs> that pop into your head from that time? That make me think of... Um, yeah, just maybe stuff you were listening to, stuff, I don't know if you listen to music on set when you're not shooting, I mean, anything Well, like I mean, if I, if I ever hear um, Billie Jean... Right. I think of Alfonso Ribeiro because in between um, setups often 
while we were waiting for them well, in front of the live audience on Fridays when we would tape in, be- in between setups, wa- um, the, the um, what do you call it, like the warm up would be, you know, we had D.L. Hughley for a long time, actually, mm. too, mm. Was, a, was warming up the audience and talking to them. And then sometimes um, all of a sudden the DJ, we had really great DJs, DJ Mike, and um, we and the DJ would sometimes um, put on Billy Jean suddenly and a spotlight would go on Alfonso, who's off to the side. He does such a good Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah, you've seen him do Michael Jackson, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. So all of a sudden the music would come on, which Alf knew was his cue. <laughs> And then a spotlight would go on him, and he'd look around like, what? What's that? <laughs> you know, like a complete like surprise thing. And we'd all act like we'd never seen what's happening before. Like, what's going on? And then they, all of a sudden, he'd, he'd look strangely up at something, and then moonwalk backwards away from it. <laughs> and then the audience starts to go crazy because they know he's going to do the Michael Jackson stuff. And he'd do a full-on Michael Jackson, you know, dance impersonation, brilliant thing. And we'd all clap and cheer and yeah this is great like we've never seen it before six years later you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's um that's actually there's one of the one of the episodes in it in the broadcast they showed like the warm-up yeah and all of you guys coming out and getting your like walk-on cheers right in a, well like, in that show yeah. too they show the warm-up in the dressing room where that's right he, where oh, Alpha, oh that's why everybody is, um associates um what is that song? Uh, Tonto. Yes. Uh, jump, jump on, on it. it. Like on it. with the show. Well, that was brilliant because they yeah. did it on the show. Yeah. They finally pulled it on the show. But what happened is before every Friday night show, um, you'd hear music because we all had our doors open and stuff. And all of a sudden you'd hear music coming from uh, Will's room. Mm. And we'd all start making. We'd start dancing our way. We'd all have our makeup and hair already done. And we'd dance our way down the hall into Will's room one by one. Everybody just starts coming in and everyone's dancing in his room. And Alf and Will... <laughs> started this like stupid like sta- dance off standoff thing mm-hmm. where they'd face each other and jump on it would come on and they started doing this silly dance they just <laughs> made this thing up where they just you know improvised yeah. playing around with, they would, and you know and it was hilarious and so they would do it every week it became a thing and it made us laugh just as hard every single solitary week and uh, which i have to say the billy jean thing did make us kind of you know cheer every week even though we were used to it it was still just as fun and the same with um this the the jump on it was hilarious and then the writers finally put it into a show because it was so funny it's so good good. there's they're nuts they would come up i mean they just they vibed off each other so hard that they were able to just improvise this bizarre i I mean it it (laughs) my my wife and i were best men and women at a wedding and um, you we were asked dance. to. Everybody was asked to pick a different thing to do down the aisle. And that's what you guys did. <laughs> it was really good. I love it. So. And now you know that's... its origin story. I mean, <laughs> I just like that it. I just like that it was a, a backstage tradition. It and was. It's nice seeing you know cast members who have kind of that chemistry. Yeah, like, they they re- those two were like incredible. It was totally organic, like strange thing. We just saw them just create this strange thing. And I just love that his his nickname is the same name as a, 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 uh, a Alf. plush Alf. alien from 80s TV. <laughs> who's, whose show we replaced? <laughs> really? Oh my, what? Not, yeah. not literally. We replaced <laughs> yeah. the time slot, I should yeah. say. replace the time slot. Yeah, wow. Alf was on at 8 o'clock on Monday well, night. I'm glad I brought it up. I was going back and forth as to whether to call out the fact that his nickname was Alf. <laughs> I don't know that every I don't know does everybody call him Alf I call him Alf a lot of us call him Alf but I don't know what I love it. I know I've never asked him what he thinks of it I just call it no. well next time you see him um, before we get to your third song how would you say you you were most like like you Karen were most like Hillary and least like Hillary um. You know, I used to just say we were only alike in the shoe size. <laughs> um, <laughs> but now, but now my that's, that's a junket question, like a, answer. Totally, but yeah. now my feet are bigger anyway. <laughs> so, so, so much for that. Um, <laughs> how much? How, how am I like her? Um, hmm. You know, there's a lot I think I admired about her that I used to put off that I used to like laugh off, but I now really appreciate, like I really appreciate her confidence. Hillary had a kind of confidence that I never had. <laughs> and it's weird because I played her. And so I was like, how come you just can't channel that in your life then? I haven't figured it out. But um, but I mean, it certainly wasn't, I, I don't like to think 
I, I grew up, one of the things that was fun about playing Hillary is I grew up very much with with the whole, like, um, if you don't have anything nice to say, you don't say anything at all. <laughs> and Hillary has the opposite way of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, no filter. And I think that was definitely a way that we were, could not have been further apart. You know, I did not know how to do that. And that was one of the things that was so fun about playing her is just looking someone straight in the face and saying the rudest thing. You could be a confident, rude person. Yeah, (laughs) I love I mean, that was really fun. Um, But how were we alike? That's a good one. I'm not sure. I still haven't figured that one out. I mean, I know that we probably I probably share the same hairstyle. We have the sim- we have a similar, <laughs> similar hairstyle. hairstyle. Yeah. She has hers. Hers is done with you know, a, you know, a whole crew like yeah. working on it and stuff. So, um, I mean, I definitely I went through a period of loving. You know, I liked clothes. I guess you know, there's nothing that that exciting to say. As I don't think well, okay. there doesn't have to be a right answer. Yeah, you know, if I think of anything um, funny. Okay, you, do, you, you can do a callback <laughs> if you come up with something. Sure. Um, all right, ready for uh, the second song? I am. <laughs> How would you like to go with this one? I'm going to talk about it first. Okay. Now this, I picked the song. However, I have to say that it's not really just the song. It is the the record album. It is the television special. It is the whole philosophy of this world, which was really the undercurrent of my whole childhood. Can I say it? Absolutely. Free to be you and me. Heck yeah. I had the t-shirt. I had the album. I I, I performed at, at our local um, YWCA. We performed things from it. It was... It was, our, it was our soundtrack. It was all inclusivity. It was all celebrating all people in all of our ways. And it was, um, you know, it was it was just really a, a beautiful, um, I think, just a philosophy of, of love and life, right? And I still very much, this is very much a part of me. It's who I am. And so this song, this album means so much to me. But then so many of the songs, you know, Rosie Greer's It's All Right to Cry and Parents are People with Harry Belafonte and Marlo Thomas, all these things. Yeah, and like Alan Alda sang a song on it. I mean, yeah, I was looking it up. It's I I remember the gist of it, but I didn't know that all those voices were on it. When we grow up with Michael Jackson and... Is it uh, Diana Ross does the song, but on the show, I think it was Roberta Flack. Yeah, Roberta Flack. Um, but, you know, I mean, these are, they, were, they were really great, sweet songs that were teaching kids about everybody being accepted for who they are, whoever they and are. And this was like the early 70s is when yeah. it came out. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so, and William likes a doll. There was a whole sketch and there was this, there was a great sketch with Marlo Thomas and, um, um, Mel Brooks, where they play the babies. Yeah. Do you remember that? And they're the two babies, and they're talking about you're a boy and I'm a girl and whatever. And by the end of it, and he's like, you know, because he likes trucks and he likes this and that, and so therefore he's a boy. It's obvious I'm a boy. And then they find out at the end that actually it's the other way around. And so all the stereotypes are out the window. And I learned all this stuff early, and it stuck with me, and it made so much sense to me. So this song, um, which is the title of the whole thing, I just, it will always be a very important song for me. Did you raise your kids listening to any of this yep. stuff? Yep, yep. Kind of figured you might. Because <laughs> that's the kind of mom I am. <laughs> well, let's listen to it. This is Free to Be You and Me. It's the album of the same name. Marlo Thomas and Friends released as an album and an illustrated book. And then it was a TV show or movie, right? It was a TV special. TV special, that's what it was. In 1972, it's our guest today, Karen Parsons' second song on Three Song Stories. This is Biography Through Music. You and me. When you were watching the TV special, were you like... I could be one of the dancers. (laughs) (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Probably. Oh, man. Um, You referred to that that Free to Be You and Me ethos when we talked a couple days ago for the other show. Oh, did I? Yeah. Well, we were were talking about how, you know, there's been pushback against, you know, more exposure to black history and things like that. And you said that, you know, I grew up, you know, as a Free to Be You and Me kid. And, you know, so it surprised me, like, after Barack Obama got elected that people pushed back, um, you know, for other than policy reasons and things right. like that. And I'm going to use that to pivot to Sweet Blackberry. 
Yeah. Which we don't have a ton of time to talk about it here. If you want to listen to it, listeners, there's a whole half hour conversation at WGCU.org slash GCL. But give us this, the, you know, tell listeners who are on this show, like mm-hmm. what it is, the work you do. Um, Sweet Blackberry is a nonprofit organization that I am the president and founder of. And the mission is to bring little known stories um, of black achievement to kids, stories that you don't hear about so much in schools, but about amazing people in American history. Um, that have done all kinds of things, invented things that we take for granted, um, all sorts of accomplishments that I think are really great for kids to know about. I said, like I said, we don't learn about so much, but also they teach kids about what they are capable of. They 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 show them that um, obstacles are actually opportunities to do great things. Um, I think that they are really remarkable stories. My mother was a librarian and told me, brought some stories to me that excited me and made me think, oh, I want to bring these to kids. This would be really important for kids to know these stories. And so I started making um, short animated films and then picture books of these stories of real inspiring individuals. But- Narrated film. The films are narrated by some yeah. pretty great voices. I've One got, of them is the, yeah. the mom on Lion King. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Alfred Woodard and Queen Latifah, Chris Rock, Lawrence Fishburne. I mean, really great people all have come on board just because they believe in the project. And um, so that's awesome. You uh, you published a young adult novel in 2019. Yeah, called How High the Moon. And um, from what I've gleaned, you are working on another one? Well, I have a new one coming out in July. So you've got one that's in the can. Yeah, it's coming out in July. Ah. Yeah, that takes place in Santa Monica in the 70s. What's it called? A little Shaka Khan in there. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's called Clouds Over California. And um, and yes, it does call. It does have a somebody's... A uh, fifteen-year-old cousin coming to stay live with them. Oh. <laughs> and, um, but there are a lot of other things that are completely fictional. <laughs> but that, but that, but uh, there's definitely some autobiographical pieces in there, and that comes out in July. And um, and then I I was teasing about something else that I was teasing out something else I'm not going to talk about that I'm working okay. on right now. Okay, let us know when you're ready to, to, to you know talk about <laughs> it's it. Too early. When you write, um, do you listen to music while you write? Yeah, I I actually have been thinking about that. It depends on what and how. Definitely in how high the moon. Um, I found myself listening to music from the 1940s because um, it takes place in in the 40s. Um, and I am and I. Like, I, like the ink spots? or Oh, my goodness. I did listen to the ink spots a little bit, too. I listened to lots of different stuff. Uh, the mother in How High the Moon mm. is has moved from down south up to Boston to try to be a jazz singer. Mm-hmm. And so she's singing a lot of standards and Got stuff. It. And so that it, that I did find myself listening to that. And when I was writing Clouds Over California, there were periods of time where I was listening to a lot of Shaka Khan and a lot of... Um, different music from the 70s um but not not entirely like soul and stuff like that i mean i was listening to zeppelin too and different stuff and um but i was just kind of placing myself there um and i was listening to al green and stuff but that's also like a little bit story wise stuff and then now um yeah now i have something else that i'm finding myself listening to is that a young adult novel as well the new one yeah. or the clouds over the account? new one. The new one, yeah. They're the others are they're like middle grade okay, to right young right. adult, and um, the new one is we'll see. I think it's middle grade young adult. We'll see. I, I I end up having to get pulled back some of my stuff sometimes. Do you aspire to maybe write one for you know grown ups? When I started writing, I was writing short story adult story short story fiction. I mean that's what I was writing. I was never thinking about writing for kids. I was never considering that. And you know what's funny? I'm going to tell you this. This is the truth. I went to a psychic (laughs) back in the Fresh Prince days who told me I was going to write children's books. And I was like, oh, God, are you kidding? (laughs) I mean, I remember feeling like she's off. (laughs) She doesn't know what she's talking about. And then it just hit me over the last few years. I'm like, wait a minute. You need to go back and find that lady. That psychic. That's what I was thinking. I'm like, where is that lady? I don't know if I want to find her or not. But I was like, wait a minute. She told me I was going to do that. But um, so it wasn't something that I set out to do. When my mom was bringing these stories to me, I that's when I got excited to do Sweet Blackberry. And then it just so happened, well, someone had to write the stories. And so I found myself writing them. I had been 
um, writing after Fresh Prince, I started studying with with um, a really great guy at Santa Monica City College, and I got really into writing, like I said, short story fiction. But the Sweet Blackberry stories just came out of, well, someone has to write them. And the next thing you know, I was like, oh, wait a minute, I'm authoring these, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. That's what's happening. And then somebody, I had a friend who like nudged me and said, you need to write a novel, I think. And that's where How High the Moon came. But I wasn't even thinking, le- not even writing for kids, but I wasn't even thinking long format. Writing a novel always seemed like, Oof, who does that? Apparently you. <sighs> Apparently I do. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Now you got two. I've got two. Yeah. I've got two, and I'm working on a third. <laughs> so when you're um, – we're going to go back to acting before we get to song three. So when you're, um, like, tr- trying to remember back to filming, you've filmed so many things, right? You've been yeah. on so many sets, so many scenes. Can you remember – like, if you're watching a movie that you were in, can you, like, remember being on set or not? Because I'm trying to think how us normal people remember. Right. And we don't have – that great a detail. I mean, can right. you remember your way into scenes, I guess is the it question. It depends. I mean, there are some things, there are moments I'll look at. Like, I don't really, I don't go back and watch stuff, so right. it's hard. But every now and then, yeah, if I look at a little clip from Major Pain, like, that, that's like somebody's doing, showing like the... Do you remember that moment? Oh, Lord have Which mercy, I it? do. <laughs> I love that movie. I do. Richard well, made me watch it. So I watched good. it last night, sort of. I, I jumped through and Damon watched your scenes. is so... Funny. Oh no! He's it's out tell. of his mind. Yeah. <laughs> it got to the point where, at one point, he had the he had them putting a scrim in between us because he couldn't look at my face because <laughs> he'd be doing his stuff and he could see me going, <laughs> trying not to laugh and making these crazy faces, trying not to laugh. So a scrim being like a like, shield, like a yes, partition. Could you please put that and block her? I don't want to look at her. He <laughs> <laughs> was so funny, and you're in scenes with him, and you're trying, and he would. St- do stuff that he didn't tell you he was yeah. gonna say or do. And he could do. do it so straight, like so, so deadpan, stra- completely like. deadpan. He would pull something out of his pocket and not tell me. And I'm, I don't want to ruin the take. Yeah. You know. <laughs> oh my god, he was so funny. So yeah, sometimes I think of I'll see. Like, so you the, remember like the dream sequence shoot? I, I, I vaguely remember <laughs> us doing that, and like, I remember like the dance. Like I'll see the dance, the dance. thing on. Um, I see that a lot, like the little gifs of that, and I I, re- I vaguely <laughs> remember like certain things. Listeners, go to our social media and you can see the picture that I showed. <laughs> uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna describe it in detail. Um, yeah. Um, uh, oh, what was I going to ask? Uh, I lost my train <laughs> you of thought. transition from major pain. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't quite done with major pain. Oh, I know what it is. Um, uh, that movie lives rent free, my brother. I listened to, um, I mentioned this to you briefly on the GC, uh, the Gulf Coast Life that we did, but I listened to a podcast that you were on way back in like 2010. <laughs> and when, um, and the, the guest host, one of the hosts brought up major pain and she was a huge Fresh Prince fan, a huge uh-huh. Hillary fan. And she said she was almost shocked because that was still during Fresh Prince. Yeah. But she suddenly saw you as an actress, actor in a oh. in a in a non Hillary role. Wasn't Hillary? Yeah. Oh. And so, what was that like for you? Because at that point, that was toward the end of the run. You had become quote unquote Hillary, and now you're yeah. doing a like a thoughtful counselor woman. Oh, but I was still like you know the girl with the hands on the hips, yeah, wagging well, her finger. All yeah. you know? definitely a '90s ca- like yeah. character. I didn't, lean, I didn't like, feel like it leaned into it though. I feel like. Well, I, yeah, maybe I mean, not. But you were you were in it. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, yeah, I was. I was just trying to be Emily. But I, yeah, it was a yeah, it's a backhanded compliment. Obviously, you know, people really thought I was Hillary. That that's right. what I was like. That that's who I. People still do. Right. You know. Um, I was even just today. Someone said something to me. They were, they said something about oh cute. They said something to me, and I remember thinking, you know. I'm a 56 year old woman, <laughs> and I think that some people still look at me and they still are like, "Oh, Hillary." <laughs> they still have a little of that, "Oh, Hillary." Thing. Well, well, I, and it's you know, it's okay. It's it's a, like I said, it's a backhanded compliment. I hope you don't mind this, but you know, I never watched Fresh Prince, so you know, oh, I, I was familiar with it and you, but I don't <laughs> see her. I see yeah. you. Oh, well, that's nice. That's like my husband. My husband had, did not know Fresh Prince from anything when we met. He he like knew that it was out there, sort of, but he didn't really know anything about it. 
and um, yeah, he'd come to learn the, hmm. hor- the horror yeah. later. <laughs> well, it's like iconic, you know. It's- yeah. The major pain line, and it's your line that sticks in my brain, and I can see your face. My brother and I, we used to watch this all the time uh, growing up. I think you're saying, you're like, Major Pain, can you please un- help me understand why you shave these children bald? <laughs> you shaved all of their heads bald. And it's just your expression, and that just lives in my brain because then it's all of these children, the big ears. Yes. It's, yeah, it's perfect. Yes, yes. That's <laughs> great. Well, let's do song number three. Okay. <laughs> Enough major pain. Okay. Uh, how'd you like to go? This is the Prince song. Um, that's a good question. Why don't we just launch into the song and I'll talk about it after. All right. This is uh, Head by Prince from his 1980 <laughs> album, Dirty Mind. It's Karen Parsons' final song here on Three Song Stories. Yeah, head. <laughs> you know, I think this when Prince first came on the scene, um, like you know, it, for us, I mean, we got to know the For You album after the, the there was the album before this before this album. This is um, Dirty Mind mm-hmm. album. The album before this with the baby blue cover and he's got the feathered hair. I want to be your lover. And he's got the lip gloss, you know, and he's like. Oh. <laughs> um, that that was when we first came, knew him. I mean, we went back and found the, the for you we discovered, which came first. Prince. We uh, yeah, it's just Prince, the the one for that. Yeah, and then the the for you we discovered later. But we discovered him during the "I Want to Be Your Lover" album, and we were like, "Oh my God, who's this?" You know, we were just so crazy about him. And but when the Dirty Mind album came out with Head and Sister and everything we were like oh my god <laughs> he's our guy this is ours <laughs> he was so rough and and raunchy and nervy and breaking all the rules and he was kind of punk in his own way right because he was so um just defiantly coming out there i remember he opened for the stones and garter belts and got you know heckled and bottles thrown at him and everything but we were like I mean, and I'm sure it was not, I'm sure part of it too was here was this guy who kind of looked like me, this mixy looking guy up on stage too, who was just like, but he was a freak, you know, he Mm. wasn't following any of the rules that he was supposed to be following. He wasn't doing any of the the stuff he was supposed to be. He wasn't in any of the camps he was supposed to be. He was his own thing. And I think all of that and the nerve of him to come, especially with a song like Head. I mean, Head, that was the thing about this song, too, is it was so, talk about breaking the rules. And we were teenagers. So it was like, oh, wow. You know, this is, this is amazing. <laughs> and I think that part of, you know, part of it, like, I remember being at my, in my best friend's, I, I, when I think of the song, I think of myself in my best friend Tarumi's bedroom playing it over and over again. You know, I feel like we played this album over and over again. And I think, you know, you feel like you're you feel like you're so you're so tough. <laughs> you know, you might not be so tough, but you're listening to Dirty Mind and Head and Sister. And it's like it just feels like you're just so edgy because I'm listening to this. This is my music. And so I think that was part of it, too. That was a lot of the appeal. Um and he became very quickly like he was ours. Like we owned him. I think by the time it was Controversy it was the next album, right? Mm-hmm. When Controversy came out, it was like we thought he was our own personal guy. Mm. You know, when you heard other people liked him, you were like, no, no, but you, you, but you don't like, <laughs> I like him. Like we like, like him. him. Yeah. I get not the it. same. You know? yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It felt very personal. Um, but I think this was one of the this song and this album were particularly when I was asked the songs I kept going oh you can't do head so let me think of something else and I would go around and and it kept coming back that I was like like, I can't not do it that's what it came down to and I'm glad you guys were you guys did it because you know I said you don't you have to (laughs) (laughs) we could do something else if this is too much but it just it just it it definitely it left a mark on me. I mean, I def- you know, it's funny. I came up as this kid who used to have to watch Betty Davis movies and Jodie Foster and all these tough, edgy women. And then Pritz, you know, and, and I got to play Hillary, who was this kind of like, you know, says her own thing. And then in reality, I'm like, I'm a much more demure woman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think it's like my alter ego <laughs> on these other people and things. It's like an outlet. <laughs> mm. uh, you ever get to see Prince play? I did. You ever get to meet Prince? Never got to meet him. I got to see him up close in his yellow suit, head to toe, looking like a 
really cute banana you know, sucking <laughs> on a red lollipop. <laughs> but um, but I didn't speak to him. I saw him at a couple different things at clubs back in the day. Uh, uh, how did you take him? Um, you know, towards the end there, he he played at the Super Bowl, and a lot of people. I was at a party and like I think half the people were like, wow, Prince can shred. Like, you know, they were like amazed that he was like an incredible musician yeah. and they had never because they had just only ever they yeah. had they yeah. had this image of Prince because they knew the name, but they'd never right. listened to it. Um, that is maybe the most mainstream thing that you can do is play the Super Bowl. Right. Um, right. What was that like for you? Well, I think the image, the image of him was so much bigger than in a way, even than what he was doing. People were just, they weren't realizing he was writing everything. He was playing everything. Did you realize that? Were yeah. you guys, you were reading the liner notes, so you were like, this dude's We knew Prince all. like nobody else knew Prince. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you had Wikipedia we, Prince before there was <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, we had full appreciation for the guy. Um, but yeah, I think people didn't, didn't really, they didn't know. His personality was so big. You know, he, he was such a big, you know, thing. Um, you know, I didn't think about the Super Bowl as as big a thing, I guess, because he was already a big thing to me. Mm. So it always felt like, yeah, yeah, he's playing Super Bowl. You know, I was like probably mad. Some part of me is probably mad that he's playing the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> you know, toward the end when he was doing the um he was doing those intimate man on a piano concerts, you know, I was certain I was gonna attend one. I had every intention of doing of seeing one and I never got a chance to. That was like, okay, this is where I want to be with Prince in this intimate kind of setting. Hmm. Uh, didn't get to see him play, but what would be the peak concert experience that you immediately popped to mind that of all the concerts you've seen? Uh, of all of the concerts I've seen of anybody? Anybody. What would be the peak? Yeah. What, what's the one that is most, like, you're most proud of having seen? Uh, you, you remember it most fondly. The craziest things happened. <laughs> that was really cute. <laughs> I, you know, I haven't been to a lot of concerts. Okay, I really haven't because, and you know what? There used to be. Oh my gosh! In Los Angeles, this is where I saw Prince in person one time. I guess the first time. There used to be something called R and B Live. Oh, wait, you said you did see Prince. I saw. Him, oh, I saw. I, oh, I blew that. I said something wrong a little bit ago. Oh, I Nobody you called me out. I got you. I thought no, you were talking yourself. I no, thought you were. No, I thought you meant. Yeah, you, no. I thought you meant. You I like never to, saw I like him. to admit to my errors, and I clearly just made one. Continue. No, I. I did see him in concert once. I thought you were talking about yourself, and no, you hadn't seen him. Yeah. And I did see him out, and I saw him at R and B Live. In the audience, it was a very small, intimate venue. They wouldn't tell you where the concert was going to be until like a few days before it. And you kind of had to know somebody. And you go and there were little booths and little cocktail lug tables. And then there'd be a little stage. I did see Shaka there. Um, Lenny Kravitz performed there. You know, Philip Bailey performed there. Lots of people performed there. Prince performed twice, the two times I didn't go. <laughs> I was a regular at R&B Live. And because they, they wouldn't tell you who the guests were right, going to be. that was part of the charm was you So you just know. go, and two times I didn't go, and Prince performed. You had to hear about it after. Oh, the pain. Yeah. I saw him there in the little yellow suit and the lollipop um, once. <laughs> <laughs> the banana in, in the banana suit. <laughs> I, don't think the banana they, I don't think they call it. <laughs> that could be your next picture thing. book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stealing that. <laughs> Just give me one little line. Little line in the title page. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yes, yes. So that I, I missed him at R and B Live. They they had him play in this. It, he played in this little tiny place. I didn't see a lot of concerts. Um, my experience at R&B Live was always fantastic. I saw, I did see Prince, and he was great. Um, did you go to school with Lenny Kravitz? I went to, yes, I went to junior high school. See, I do my Lenny. research. Very good. I went to junior <laughs> high school with Lenny. Lenny was um, Lenny was older than I was, and I had the biggest crush on him. How could you not? Right. I mean, I had the biggest crush on him. He had a big old afro, and he was like, and we would go at uh, sometimes on like lunch break, a block away to this guy Sam's house, and they and Sam and we were friends with another older guy who would let us younger kids come along with him, and we would sit and we'd watch the guys jam, 
and Lenny would jam and Sam and all these guys would play. I was just like, oh. Yeah, God. Nail in the coffin. Just like, yeah. <laughs> oh. He did not know I existed. But, and we've laughed about this together. Years later, um, no, we didn't go to high school. He went to a different high school. He went to Beverly High, I went to Sam High. And then after school, um, he was he was Romeo Blue. He, my best, my very best friend to Rumi and my best, my other really good friend Karen were his backup singers. They tried to make me a backup singer, but as we know, I can't sing. <laughs> so you didn't, didn't need a backup dancer? I didn't know. <laughs> I danced while they sang. <laughs> You'd be off in, the, in a spotlight like, yeah, uh, like uh, Alf. Yes, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I love that. Um, but, um, yeah, so then he actually ended up, but Lenny ended up having a crush on me. But I had a boyfriend. Mm. And so we've kind of been able to laugh about the timing. Whew. Ships in the night. Yeah, but he's a, a really lovely person, I'm happy to say. All right. You ready for a speed round? No, oh, no. You didn't tell me that was going to be a speed, There's speed round. There's speed round. This is how we head in for I'm a landing. <laughs> Do you have a nickname that has stuck over the course of your life that you would be willing to share? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple and they're not a big deal. Oh, okay. Well, then what are they? KP. Everybody calls me KP. Okay. Everybody. I mean, if you just met me yesterday, you will call me tomorrow and you'll be like, hey, KP, what's up? I don't know why. Okay. Um, and Peaches. Peaches. <laughs> Which is not anything naughty. My sixth grade teacher gave me that nickname, and she it was, she was a very nice, you know, woman. She was. <laughs> who who would be the people who still call you Peaches versus KP? Um, people. Well, hmm, Peaches, Peaches. Gosh, like anyone closer who, friends, family. Anyone friends? who's heard Peaches uh. will are will just out randomly call me Peaches. Or definitely my anyone from my sixth grade class who, thanks to Facebook, I'm still in touch with many of them. <laughs> um, do you know the musician Peaches? I do. The artist Peaches? Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, the song that comes to mind, yes. I can't. I almost not, said not it out nearly, loud. Not nearly as yeah. innocent as the, the pain your away. name. Ease the pain Ease away. The, there yeah. you go. Yeah. Ease the pain away. Yeah, Ease that's the, the word. Away. Yeah. I love that song. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow. I've got no idea, but that's wow. okay. We can't, we can't talk later. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can't talk about it. Um, <laughs> when was the last time you bought music that had physical form? So not a stream, not a digital download. Something um, that you could hold in your hand. When was the last time? Mm, mm, mm. It probably wasn't that long ago. Come on now. Because we have record player, two record players in our house. Okay. So I play vinyl. Okay. Um, you know. Well, that's, I mean, that at least. You What's don't the vinyl to... you most recently remember buying? Purchasing? Yeah. Or um, borrowing, I guess. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, buying. <laughs> buying. Um, God, that's good. I don't remember. I remember buying something that I'm going to say was from the 70s and it was really scratched. Really scratched. Like, like I was infuriated, like I wanted to send it, take it back, which you can't go to a record store and be like, this is scratched. And they're like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I went to Urban Outfitters or something, but it wasn't that kind of situation. It was a, I don't remember. That's okay. Just the fact that you still have physical form is enough of what we're trying oh, to my get goodness. at. Because there's a lot of people that are like, yeah, I, it's been 20 years since I've held music in my No, hand. we have tons. And um, my husband has a huge collection huge collection and um yeah we we listen to vinyl you've talked about not being able to sing karaoke karaoke is a fun thing but i don't really do it out in public um, and i need i need to because it's it's the fear in me i i watched you in an interview where you talked about a song that you sometimes do in karaoke karaoke at home Oh, okay. <laughs> so I know you, which I know you're talking about the um It's somebody that I used to yes, know. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I remember when I was asked about it, there's that song and the other song that I th thought would be a perfect uh karaoke song is um oh now see I couldn't remember it before now I'm gonna remember it. It was I don't wanna sing the lines. Oh. Do it <laughs> Um You know, you were working as a waitress in a cocktail what is it? Bar. Bar. <laughs> That much is true. Come on, sing it. Cause it's, it's, 
Uh, uh, that's all I know. Not a place, even with or without, without you. you. <laughs> <laughs> so you do though do karaoke at home? Uh, yeah, we have a karaoke machine in my house. Like a machine. Yeah. We have a little. So it's not thing. even just like uh, through your Roku or something, which I'm sure is a thing now. But you, oh. so you have like a karaoke machine. No, we have machine. a machine that has a the microphone. microphone. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. I'm I'm on a mission to change. To, I want I want us to do karaoke like they do like in Japan and in Korea, where really like did. so it's it's not a it's not a bar with a machine uh-huh. and the whole room is you full of rooms. strangers. There are rooms that you rent like the way you rent like a bowling alley lane. I love and that. then because then you go in with like it would be like the four of us. Yes. And room guess what? If you rent if four of us rent a machine for two hours, you're gonna you have to sing. Right. So no one gets to be like, oh yeah, you're bad. But Right. Like, and the strangers that are off to the side. But they're like, never gonna sing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So don't that is Don't you want me. That's I don't, don't, I mean, don't you want me. <laughs> I've been yeah. trying to don't figure my way in. You've been, me, singing, baby. You've been <laughs> quietly singing over there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like Richard's talking. I can work on this. <laughs> yeah, the chorus. Yeah. Wait, wait, wasn't wasn't that uh, didn't one, one of our guests put make that uh, he had made, he'd made a tape on the on a he 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 made a cassette tape that was supposed to be a mixtape for a family road trip, but he just looped that. I don't think it was oh. that song. Was it? Is, I think it might have been. <laughs> Uh, and it was just and it was just over and over and his his dad was like I'm gonna throw this out the window. Yeah, that's like a stalker song. That's like scary, <laughs> like, over, especially over and over again. So I'm on a mission. Let's. I, I think everybody should be able to do something like that. It sounds fun. That Let's, is a good idea. Um, if you were a championship wrestler, what music would you enter with? Oh my gosh. <laughs> If I were a championship wrestler, I'm trying to get my wrestle my head around that one first. It's like if I were a wrestler, um, um, I don't know. I don't know. I can't even. I can't think of a single song. <laughs> <laughs> I've stunned you. You have stunned me. What would, what would your wrestler name be? And maybe we can back our way into this. Well, it wouldn't be Peaches. <laughs> <laughs> K Peach, K P K P Peach. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe Peaches would be a good wrestling. Name. Peaches is your wrestling name, and your song is and my song. Is, whatever is, that song you guys were talking about. Um, <laughs> that that could work. Oh, ease the pain away. Ease the pain away. That would hey, be a pretty, that's a pretty solid good, wrestler gotta, walk-on song. That okay, would be pretty see, good. So now you, you're going to have to look the song up, and you guys are going to have to play it. <laughs> I don't think I can. That one. There's I'd, a section. There is a portion of there's it that I can put here. I really. Have I'm to look sure up there's this one that's, that's that's edited. I'm I sure there's one that to show you this beeps one. the pain away. Beeps the pain away. Um. Okay. Um. Uh. Song you wish you could hear again for the first time. Oh, um, maybe when doves cry mm. by Prince. I remember when I very first heard that, and I was just, I was lit up. I oh god, I loved that. I thought it was just I I loved that. Oh, you know, there's another song. No, I'll I'll stick with that. <laughs> I was thinking of there's another song, but I'm now I'm afraid I'm not gonna remember the name of it. But when doves cry really got me. Can you remember being in the theater when that when, when Purple Rain opened? Seems like hyper fan would be there opening night. I was. I mean, we were there. I saw it right away, and I remember remember all of the whole like drama behind the scenes and the whole like oh Vanity was supposed to do it and who's Apollonia and oh there's Ap- that's Apollonia and all of that stuff that went on and um, I've seen it so m- so many times now. It's all blurred together. It's all blur. <laughs> it's all a blur. I listen. We listen to the album so much. I feel like this would be good, a good time. In the strange event that Karen doesn't know this, can you t- uh, talk about the recording of Purple Rain and that that live mic? Oh, yeah. Um, I have this little video that kept popping up online, and then it would get taken down immediately. Did you know that um, that the first three songs I think of of Purple Rain, the album, were actually recorded live? at a benefit concert in Minneapolis, the very first time he ever played that song for human beings out in the world. Like the ones on the album. So what you hear on the album was him debuting that song. He hired like this massive team of recording engineers and it's like hidden Purple Rain lore that for whatever reason, I have the video I can share it with you. On the album? Yeah. On yes, the album? they used it yeah. for the album. It's the which first is never three songs? And, and this never little video, they have, it's really like really low res video, but you can watch 
and it's got a little subtitles. It says, this is where they cut away to f- fill in this fill in the studio, but this wow. is where we go back to live. Wow. And it's like you can see them recording it's, oh, it's, it's the, what it's you've the, heard wait, a million times. It's the last three. It's the I, would last di- three. I Would Die For You, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, was... Baby I'm a Star, and Purple Rain. So you can, so I'll, I'll you, share when, this video with you. You when, can actually sort of see him playing Purple Rain for the first time. Yeah. And then that's what you've heard a million times, which you assume was... Recorded in a studio and fine tuned or whatever. That makes sense though, because because when you think about when I think about the film mm-hmm. and I think of those songs, they all sounded like they were all performed live in the film. Right, and that's I think why he did this because that's how much of a genius yeah. he I is. I mean, so I think when I think of them, I do think of the physical, the, the him physically on stage performing yeah, yeah. them because I saw that in the film. Well, so. I'll, I'll I'll share that with you. It just okay. blew my mind that you know, yeah, yeah, they record it live, but maybe after he's already toured with it and fine tuned it. Yes. But that was like, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna do this once. Was he amazing? And that's what? that's yeah. gonna be it. You know, a lot of people did not know. Uh, I, what I found that a lot of people didn't know about they didn't know that he what a genius he was until after he passed. Yeah, yeah. I found a lot of people going, can you believe he did this? And yes. Can you believe he did that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can put all these amazing details in the, the yellow banana book. Prince <laughs> 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 in the banana suit. Um, With a any With a songs you'll avoid listening to? Oh, God. Teresa Brewer, mm. for one. Um I avoid listening to. That sounds so mean. Um, uh, <laughs> to not be mean. Are there any that are there any that um, make you think of a thing that makes you avoid listening to it? It makes me think of something else. That yeah, the same yeah. way. The same way Kinda that these like take you back to being in the room place. with your cousin. You might go, ah, nah. Um, if there are any, if there's anything like that, like that's just like uh, fingernails on a chalkboard to a time in my life. No, no albums, no record albums. I mean, but my dad did have Lawrence Welk on in the house a lot, and that's another thing that I just, I don't need that in my life. Sorry. That's uh, that's fine. We're gonna, <laughs> that's we're an answer. Leave that right there. Um, uh, if you could broadcast a song into the head of everyone on the planet and create a global musical moment, which song would you do? Hmm. Global musical moment. Um. Jeremiah was a bullfrog. <laughs> I think that's a great answer. Um, what would your 14-year-old self think of who you are today and the arc you've experienced since then? She would not believe this was her. Yeah? No. She'd be like, who? What? No. I think I was such a different person at that age, and I think I was projecting. I was in such a, <laughs> such a different direction in my head than where I've landed. Um yeah, I think that she would, I think she'd think I was interesting, but I don't think she would think this was her. I think it's just so unrecognizable to my 14-year-old self. Hmm. Any advice you'd want to send back to her? Yeah, a lot. I'd say shave your head and do the mohawk, for oh, one. It's the 80s. Take advantage of I it. I would say mohawk, look, do the storm mo- mohawk. Yes. Oh, platinum, platinum, platinum. Hi. There's oh, high five and happening. Do the, the plat- oh, mohawk. Do the platinum store mohawk. Do it. You won't regret it. You'll still get work. Don't worry about it. <laughs> don't don't chicken out on the excuse that you know no one will hire me. Uh-huh. Um, and just in general, like go with those impulses and things that tell you like, oh, I want to do this and oh, I should do this. Don't hold back. Do it. Be all of you. And then if you find out that you didn't want to do it, then later you'll be like, oh, well, I tried it and I was wrong. And, but it's better than not doing it, not doing anything, and then just playing it safe the whole time. Hmm. All right. It's time for you to recommend three people that oh. you'll share this with, who you think there's a sliver at least of a chance that we can get them on the show someday. Okay. She's drawing on the wall with her. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I would say to reach out to who I or I'll reach out to, I guess. Gina Kamensky. Gina um, is a brilliant animator, filmmaker who actually helped me found Sweet Blackberry and who uh, animated the first couple Sweet Blackberry films. She's genius. She uh, teaches at RISD. And um, I would love to hear Gina's answers. Um, second. 
Chris Joyner. I'm talking to you. <laughs> uh, Chris Joyner is one of my dearest friends and has, uh, he's a musician. He plays, he does his own wonderful music. He's done music for Sweet Blackberry Films as well. He's scored our films. He's so talented. He plays with people around the world with the most incredible, best people. He plays a million instruments. He's really a, a virtuoso uh, keyboardist. I will say piano player. He's he's incredible. Great musician and great friend. And he's the person I turn to uh, periodically and go, music, I need music. Hmm. And he'll send me music and tell me what to listen to. He's introduced me to you know, people over the years like Jeff Buckley and Fiona Apple and you know, and a million other people over time. He's like, I he's, like his taste so yes. far. He's yeah. the person who has <laughs> who has sent me this stuff before it hit the air before it was on the airwaves, but I had barely touched the airwaves. Um, he's really he's great, and I would love to hear what Christopher has to say. Um, and then I'll say my little sister Tatiana Ali, big from, fan also. Yeah, yeah Miss Ta. I would love to hear what Tatiana says um, about her. I'd love to hear her three songs. I'm really curious. I am too. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, Karen, you've done it. Do you have okay. any final thoughts to leave us with? No, this was so much fun. Can we just do it a little longer? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, we can do some bonus content. I mean, you can no. stay here and not do. <laughs> Actually, we are going to We are gonna do some bonus content, yeah. but any final real thoughts? Um. N- real thoughts? That was a real thought. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to stay here. No, we can call no. the university and tell them that you're not coming. <laughs> yeah. No, I just um, I just want to say thank you. I've had such a good time, you guys. This was really awesome. I love that you do this. And um, I love that I got to be a part of it. And I, I think I even hit some little points in me that I have to think about. <laughs> just little scratched some little things in my memory that I have to think about. That's, that's what we do. Thank you good. for so much. Thank you so much for doing it. Yeah, thank you. We make three song stories in the studios of WGCU Public Radio on the campus of Florida Gulf Coast University in Fort Myers, Florida. Richard Chinqui is co-creator and producer. Tara Calligan is online content producer and host. Our production assistant is Jared the Intern Gonzalez, Christophus is executive producer, and our theme song was made by Dave 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 Cowan and Stick Martin at Monkey House Studio in St. Pete. For this week's parting tune, we're going back one year to episode number 213 guest Bob Morris. Bob is a novelist who writes Caribbean-themed mysteries, and he's published several collections of nonfiction, and he teaches food writing and crime fiction at Rollins College in Orlando. Bob's first song takes him back to sitting at the dinner table when he was a kid, kind of wishing he had earplugs. When I was growing up, I mean, we always sat around the dinner table. You know, we we joined, you know, in, in the evenings, but particularly Sunday dinner after church, sit down at the dinner table with my deaf grandmother and the rest of our large family. And my dad would always put show tunes or movie soundtracks on at a very high volume so that my grandmother could hear them. And one of the first ones I remember listening to was the soundtrack from South Pacific, There's Nothing Like a Dame. And again, I liked it because there's some curse words in it. (laughs) When was the last time you listened to this song? Probably when I was deciding on what to share here, and I said, oh, how awful is it? And uh, it, it doesn't really hold its age, but it brings back memories like that. So when we asked you for these three songs, then you hearkened back to that time and this one popped in? That's it, exactly. Keep listening. Next time on Three Song Stories. We played it in our Catholic gym for a talent show. Um, The look on everyone's face was at best disappointed.